It's the early 2000s, and fantasy franchises have landed like a tidal wave. Lord of the Rings has defied all odds and raked in the Oscars. Harry Potter is pumping them out. The prequels are prequeling at Lucasfilm. It was the time to be alive for fantasy. Disney wasn't going to let these go unchallenged, though. So Disney came in swinging with 2005's The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. Originally written by Professor C.S. Lewis, who happened to be close friends with J.R.R. Tolkien, these books were the defining children's fantasy series of the latter half of the 20th century. Disney wanted to translate the magic and adventure of the books to the big screen. No expense was spared to launch this bid at fantasy franchise dominance. Weta Workshops jumped straight from Lord of the Rings to Narnia to design and create the creatures, costumes, weapons, props, and CGI. I mean, come on, this is the best Minotaur in cinema thus far because it looks real because it was real. Practical effects for the win. The result was legitimate fodder for nostalgia. Excellent child acting, magnificent visuals, impressively timeless CGI, and a plot wrapped in adventure, bravery, and redemption made it a Christmas hit at the box office, raking in nearly $750 million. As an adaptation, it was overall just about as faithful to the book as a fan could hope for, and certainly has its place among the best book-to-screen adaptations. And don't get me started on how Harry Gregson Williams was divinely inspired to cook up one of the most magical and enchanting film scores in the history of the human race. This adaptation was also miraculous in light of the version that we could have gotten, one that Paramount was working on in the 90s. Douglas Gresham, stepson of C.S. Lewis, was sent the script and later described its horrors. <coughs> Fade into a smoggy mid-1990s Los Angeles. The Pevensies have been forced to leave London because of Edmund's wayward CD-stealing habits. But the White Witch lures Edmund with Turkish delight? No. Streetwise teens don't know anything about Turkish delight. The witch lures Edmund with enchanted cheeseburgers. Is that Santa Claus and his sleigh? Maverick's F-18 Super Hornet doing barrel rolls? No, it's the White Witch's sleigh that can fly now. They fly now? They fly now! Don't get too close or she might open her mouth and start blasting you with flocks of evil birds. The smashing success of the first movie gave Disney all the confirmation they needed to go full steam ahead adapting the next book in the series, Prince Gaspian. It really looked like they had a shot at rivaling Warner Brothers' Harry Potter machine. Disney had their template cut out for them. Make it great, make it for families, and put it on a Christmas release and watch the cash flow in. Did they follow their own winning formula? No. No, they didn't. Instead, they edged it closer to a teen-targeted movie with elements like an added romance between Caspian and Susan, and most importantly, a summer release. To be fair, after some research it looks as though they did at first plan on a Christmas release for 2007, but right after Columbia announced that family fantasy movie Water Horse would also be released December of 2007, right before Prince Caspian, Disney switched it to the summer of the next year. The movie turned out great anyhow. Though it deviated farther from the book than the first movie, I personally enjoyed most of it nearly as much as the first. Despite a few flaws, it's got the charm, the feels, and some incredible visuals. And as always, Weta knocked it out of the park with their production design. Also, I never knew I needed to see a battle centaur rear up on its hind legs and charge with a bunch of minotaurs while holding a sword the size of a telephone pole, but can I get a... The plot is even a little more deep and nuanced than a typical family fantasy movie, as we have some surprisingly dark notes in the story, morally complex characters, and some really interesting political scheming behind the throne. It might have contributed to the shift away from a family tone that audiences didn't care for, but I found it interesting. I also just love how the Telmarine Lords totally manipulate the king into a one-on-one -on -one duel here. This is not a question of bravery. So you're bravely refusing to fight a swordsman half your age? I didn't say I refused. You shall have our support, Your Majesty. Whatever your decision. Sire, our military advantage alone provides the perfect excuse to avoid what my brother... I'm not avoiding anything. I 
was merely pointing out that my lord is well within his rights to refuse. His majesty would never refuse. He relishes the chance to show the people the courage of their new king. Nonetheless, Disney's really scheduled change from Christmas to summer forced her to compete in one of the most legendary movie summers in history, 2008. This meant it had to fight for the audience's spare change and anticipation after such box office behemoths as the one, the only, The Dark Knight. And not only The Dark Knight, but there was also Marvel's iconic grand entry, Iron Man. And then there was Indiana Jones 4. And there was also Wally. And Kung Fu Panda. And The Incredible Hulk. And Journey to the Center of the Earth and Mummy 3. Needless to say, there was no room for Prince Caspian among one of the most stacked movie summers ever. It had all the ingredients for a magical and epic adventure of a holiday movie, and had they opted for a Christmas release instead, I don't see why it couldn't have grossed a good $600 million or so at least. After this simple mistake, Disney realized what it had done and more carefully optimized the release date for the next movie. Nope, just kidding. Instead, Disney dropped the franchise entirely. Oh, I forgot. You're broken. I don't want to play with you anymore. It seems this decision was also affected by a renegotiation of the deal between Walden and Disney that wasn't in Disney's favor, a further discouragement for the movie when Prince Caspian's box office didn't measure up. Walden Media, Disney's partner in the first couple movies, then found a partner in 20th Century Fox to go ahead with the third movie, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. This movie didn't have the same budget as the first two and lacked the same talent, from the acting to the adaptive writing. And as far as CGI goes, this dragon is serviceable at best, but just doesn't quite cut it. Despite these things, the film is still at least watchable and contains a few really cool moments. It also served to launch Will Poulter's career, as his performance was the biggest gem of the whole film. I don't know what kind of prank this is, but I want to wake up right now! <laughs> I demand to know just where in the blazes am I? You're on the Dawn Treader, the finest ship in Narnia's navy. <laughs> <laughs> The production of The Silver Chair was announced in 2012, but it remained in development hell for a few years before eventually the rights expired and it remained unmade. It was a shame, as Joe Johnson was set to direct. From his statements about the project, it seemed as though he understood and wanted to emphasize the dark, interesting, gritty tone this book had in contrast to the rest of the series. In 2018, it was announced that the rights to Narnia had been purchased by... Netflix! Yeah. Yeah! I'm the only one celebrating is me, huh? A quick overview of Netflix's library of content makes it pretty difficult to imagine them creating a family-friendly fantasy movie series full of charm and faithfulness to the original source material. There's maybe a few exceptions, but success in Netflix's content strategy seems largely to be a game of capturing eyeballs, not necessarily excellence. Netflix planned for a complete reboot to adapt all the books and kept referring to the stories as the Narnia Universe hinting at additional spin-off stories in addition to the books. Netflix, just... No, this is not Marvel. You can't just make everything a cinematic universe with endless spin-offs and empty cash grabs. Narnia has an irreplaceable style and a clear beginning and end baked into the story. Thankfully, in the last six years or so that Netflix has owned the rights, there have been almost zero updates on the development of Narnia. It's actually impressive to see how silent it's been, like they have practically no interest at all in adapting it. Most recently, a New Yorker article briefly mentioned that Greta Gerwig is tapped to direct two of the Narnia films for Netflix, and more recently, Greta's mentioned that they'll likely begin filming sometime in 2024. Oddly enough, at the time of this article, there has been no direct confirmation from Netflix about this news, but assuming it's true, Greta Gerwig is possibly not the worst pick, but Netflix helming the project still leaves me with some misgivings. First, let's point out the purpose of a reboot. They're usually reserved for film series that just didn't cut it in terms of quality or faithfulness of adaptation, like the Percy Jackson series. It's pretty clear when a story's in need of a reboot. That's where Disney's Narnia is different from most other rebooted franchises. Virtually nobody cared for the Percy Jackson movies, or at least none of the dedicated fans. In contrast, the Narnia movies have millions of fans worldwide, and most of the trilogies accepted largely by the fanbase as being a great adaptation. 
To reboot something that, aside from the third movie, isn't broken would be akin to something like rebooting the Star Wars prequels. They weren't perfect, and one movie just isn't super great at all, but there's far too much greatness in it to just cast it aside. Maybe I'm just holding on to nostalgia, but the possibility of remaking the first Narnia and actually making audiences agree that the remake is better than the original would be a near impossible task. They'd once again have to have perfect casting, incredible and timeless CGI, and a host of other things that made the first one so iconic. To sum it up, it would be a shame to try rebooting it. It's like trying to replace Brendan Fraser in The Mummy. Oh wait, they already tried that. With that being said, this all gives me an intriguing thought. What if Disney got back the rights to Narnia from Netflix and finished out the series? Disney's series just waits there for completion. The time is perfect as we've possibly never seen greater demand for good fantasy. This is still likely highly unrealistic, and there may be some impossible legal barriers to overcome for Disney to get the rights for this, but it is still fun to think about. One of the biggest perks for Disney finishing out the series is that the actors from the first movie are now adults, which is perfect for stories like The Horse and His Boy and The Last Battle, which feature the Pevensey children in their adulthood at the exact age that the actors are now. It would be perfect timing, no need for casting an older version, something that doesn't always work too well in movies. James McAvoy can come back as an older Tumnus in The Horse and His Boy, and Tilda Swinton can come back as the White Witch in The Magician's Nephew, since she apparently has the same immortal genes as Paul Rudd. Nothing summons the nostalgia and charm back like seeing actors return from the original franchise films, except these wouldn't just be forced empty cash grabs by studios, they'd be continued adaptations of the rest of the book series. It's a perfect way to reignite fan interest. It's also no secret that Disney hasn't been doing too well financially lately. Faltering interest in their strongest brands and many other factors has Disney desperate for cash, and reviving a once popular family franchise could be a great move for them. One of Disney's big recent focuses has been getting more traffic on Disney+, Plus, something Narnia could provide as they could potentially turn a book like The Magician's Nephew into a five episode series as that story is pretty episodic in nature. Also they could totally flesh out the battle at the end of the world in Charn. This may be a completely unrealistic idea and it's very possible that Netflix will continue with the production, but seeing such an excellent franchise stay unfinished certainly makes one think about the potential, however unrealistic. No matter which studio develops it, some have doubted the potential of Narnia as a viable film franchise, saying that it's impossible to adapt for a few reasons. C.S. Lewis didn't write these in chronological order, nor did he focus solely on one batch of characters for every book. Critics say this leaves the audience too confused on where exactly they are in the story. We can see that the stories follow the Pevensey children and their adventures in Narnia, then Eustace joins them in the Don Treader, and then Eustace is joined by Jill in the Silver Chair, and in the last battle where we see the Pevensies again. The only exceptions to the storyline are the Magician's Nephew and the Horse and His Boy, the former being a Narnia origin story and the latter being an adventure set in the Golden Age of Narnia. There are multiple ways around the difficulties posed by this. One includes starting the Disney reboot with the Horse and His Boy, so that we get a shot of familiarity and nostalgia seeing the older Pevensies and Tumnus again in Narnia's Golden Age, then proceed with the Magician's Nephew so that the Silver Chair and the Last Battle can be done back to back to prevent excessive aging of the main characters, and so we can focus on Eustace and Jill without jumping around. For Netflix, a lot of timeline issues could be solved if they approach the story in chronological order instead of publication order. The point is, as Lord of the Rings taught us in the early 2000s, Many stories have been considered impossible to adapt, until they aren't. All it takes is a little creativity. One drawback that must be mentioned is that based upon Disney's performance the last few years, the general public's trust in their ability to faithfully and excellently adapt a great story like Narnia is kind of at an all-time low. No matter if Netflix continues with their adaptation or somehow Disney ended back up with Narnia, it would be wise of them to remember that passionate fan bases are good at doling out cash and free word of mouth marketing when the stories they cherish are done justice. In order to do so, one of the easiest and most logical steps that Netflix or Disney could take is to hire directors that are already fans of Narnia. Rob Reiner with Princess Bride, Gareth Edwards with Rogue One, Peter Jackson with Lord of the Rings, and Andrew Adamson with Narnia. These are all descriptions of directors that were already mega fans of the stories they were adapting before they signed on to direct. And look how those are remembered. The directors knew what was essential to the adaptation because they had gone on the same journey and felt the same emotions as all the fans. While not a complete guarantee of success, this is one of the easiest ways a studio can help ensure a faithful adaptation and thus undying support and ticket sales from fans for years to come. The unadapted books of Narnia represent an untapped goldmine in cinema magic. 
from the sands of Tarkhan to the cosmic epicness of the last battle. We can only hope that future adaptations will do it justice, as it's an opportunity to bring to life something that has inspired fans for well over half a century. I also wouldn't mind seeing more battle centaurs going ham on bad guys like a galloping armory of John Wick medieval fantasy vengeance 1v1ing enemy generals like the, the new kids at the annual neighborhood water balloon war. 